unsurpassed, penetrating and perfect Dharma is rarely met with, even in a hundred thousand million culpas, having it to see and listen to, to remember and accept, I vow to taste the truth of the Tathagata's words. Well, good morning <laughs> to people in the Zendo and good morning and good afternoon to people online. Uh, I'd like to just talk about mindfulness today. It's really the foundation of our whole practice is present moment awareness. It's sort of the gate that allows us to hear the teachings, to engage with reality in a wholesome way, to be wise, to be compassionate. It really all begins with our capacity to be present. To be present with our mind, which Thich Nhat Hanh often calls coming home, which I think is so beautiful. Just coming home to this present moment And the nice thing about coming home is if you look closely at that, it implies that we have drifted away from home. And that's, that's kind of what happens when we become preoccupied with our thoughts. And in the preoccupation with the thoughts, we miss what's arising right in front of us. So coming home is... Uh, the practice of not rejecting the thoughts, but not becoming um, so focused on them that we miss what's right in front of us. Coming home to just this moment. And unexpectedly, when we do that, when we just see the sky, just hear the birds, it has this capacity to not just calm, calm us, calm our minds, but to heal our worries. It has great capacity to heal us of our mental pain. Even if just for a few moments, we can notice the dappled sunlight on the ground. Just in those few moments, if we really notice the dappled sunlight or the sound of a dog barking in the distance, we fully give our attention to that. In that moment, we are not worrying about something. Can't really do two things at once. We can move back and forth between things. We can't actually do two things at once with full attention. So we, if we give practice giving our full attention to very ordinary things, we can heal, we can heal the mental habits that cause us distress. I think all of us have the capacity to be very focused on the present when the present 
is stimulating in a particular kind of way. I often think about why it is that people um, become very absorbed in particular things like spectator sports would be an example, or video games, or rock climbing, investing on the stock exchange, any range of things that have a high level of stimulation. Part of the attraction of that high level of stimulation is it does allow us, people find it possible then to be very focused on the present. But the difference between that kind of engaged present moment awareness and what we cultivate in our Zazen practice is that those forms of high stimulus that allow us to be very focused in the present. There's a number of things. One, they can be neutral, they can be positive and wholesome, but they can also be harmful. So in and of themselves, being able to focus intensely on something like rock climbing or the stock exchange or surfing or a mathematical problem in and of itself, isn't going to necessarily lead to wisdom and compassion. And that kind of intense mental um, focused awareness and attention is also dependent on those conditions being stimulating and continuing to be stimulating. When we can be present minded in a very ordinary circumstance, like just sitting in a room or just walking, or dealing with ordinary daily tasks like brushing one's teeth or putting on one's shoes. When we can be present in, in those situations, it means that we're cultivating the capacity to be present-minded in all situations. And that, that capacity to be present to ordinary low stimulus, you could say, low stimulus situations, calms the mind in such a way that we then are able, we actually naturally then cultivate a wisdom and a compassion. Wisdom and compassion flow naturally from a truly relaxed mind, a mind that's truly at ease, that doesn't require conditions to be a particular way for it to be present. A mind that can be present in all conditions, whether they are very simple and uh, not very stimulating, or whether they are painful and difficult, if we can remain present minded and not wish to escape, or if they are very pleasant experiences. You can just stay steady with the pleasant experience. And uh, sometimes maybe all of us have experienced this, that when things are pleasant, sometimes we can get a little overexcited and it kind of, it kind of goes a little overboard. <laughs> but if we can just stay steady with pleasant experiences as well, then, uh, then our mind is very strong. We have a mind that doesn't rely upon conditions being a particular way for it to remain engaged.
So in relation to experiences that are unpleasant, there is a fairly strong temptation to want to get away from the unpleasant experience. And sometimes that would be appropriate if it's just something that is um, like a hot fire, it's appropriate to pull your hand away from a hot flame. But some unpleasant experiences are actually calling for us to stay connected with that unpleasant experience. To really be curious about it and stay with it and not avoid it. Sometimes when we habitually avoid unpleasant experiences that have a similar quality to them, maybe as an example, uh, many people have anxiety about being judged by others. So if one's tendency when one is feeling judged by others and imagining that you're being judged harshly in some way, if the tendency is to try and escape from that experience over and over, then that fear will just stay in the mind and will keep recurring. It will just keep recurring. And for some people, of course, these particular fearful thoughts recur for their whole lives. But the healing occurs only in the present moment. So in a situation like that, if one can remain steady while one is feeling judged and instead just notice the sensation in the body, my face is feeling flushed, my thoughts are starting to race, I'm having imaginings of what they're thinking of me. And then if we can stay with that, then we can start also um, letting some of our natural wisdom come up in us. We might come up with the thought of, I feel they're judging me, but I can't know for sure that they are. I feel that they're judging me, but I don't think that I am actually being this thing that I imagine they think of me. <laughs> or it's okay for people to judge me, even if they are. I'm still an okay human being anyway, even if I made mistakes. These sorts of thoughts, we start to be able to have these sorts of thoughts when we stay, keep our awareness in the present. So even when the present moment is difficult, the teachings encourage us to not try and escape from it not try to physically escape or mentally escape. Just to keep observing, observing what our, observing the thoughts that are, are, are arising in our mind. And when we notice thoughts arising in our mind, the teaching is not, not to go get so involved in the content of the thought, but just notice the tone of the thought. At the tone of the thought, you might, you might notice I'm feeling a little sad or I'm feeling a little anxious. That's really as much as we need to, to do when noticing thoughts arising. Just sort of notice the type of thought and then just let it be and it will drift drift of its own accord. It might not drift of its own accord instantly. <laughs> Often our practice, we have to practice, you know, repeatedly. Daily zazen is very beneficial. Doing zazen for years is very beneficial. The more we practice, the more we see these benefits and our capacity to be skillful increases.
we'll read a little bit from one of Thich Nhat Hanh's most well-known, but one of his very early books written in the 60s, The Miracle of Mindfulness. I'd really recommend any, all of his books. Let's see. This section's called Mindfulness of the Mind. Someone might well ask, is relaxation the only goal of meditation? In fact, the goal of meditation goes much deeper than that. While relaxation is a necessary point of departure, once one has realized relaxation, it is possible to realize a tranquil heart and clear mind. To realize a tranquil heart and clear mind is to have gone far along the path of meditation. Of course, to take hold of our minds and calm our thoughts, we must also practice mindfulness of our feelings and perceptions. To take hold of your mind, you must practice mindfulness of the mind. You must know how to observe and recognize the presence of every feeling and thought which arises in you. A Zen master wrote, if the practitioner knows his or her own mind clearly, they will obtain results with little effort. But if they do not know anything about their own mind, all of their efforts will be wasted. I just want to pause there to say, when it says all of their efforts will be wasted, sounds a little bit kind of harsh. <laughs> It might be more helpful to say, not that all of their efforts will be wasted, but that when we're really curious about our own minds, if we are, let ourselves be really curious about our own minds, even the parts of our minds that make us cringe. I think most of us have little parts of our mind that make us cringe. <laughs> it's parts of ourselves that we really feel like embarrassed about or ashamed about or fearful about or defensive about, there's a part of us that's like that. We can just keep with our Zazen practice, slow down and take the risk of just being willing to look at our own minds in these tricky, tricky spots. Then nothing will be wasted. But it is probably true if we have very strong defensive barriers where we won't go, then practice will have very limited capacity for us. Zazen will have limited capacity for us. So I think this is the point that was being made here. If you want to know your own mind, there is only one way to observe and recognize everything about it. This must be done at all times during your day-to-day -day life, no less than during your hour of meditation. During meditation, various feelings and thoughts may arise. If you don't practice mindfulness of the breath, those thoughts will soon lure, lure you away from mindfulness. But the breath isn't simply a means by which to chase away such thoughts and feelings. Breath remains the vehicle to unite body and mind and to open the gate to wisdom. I think that's a lovely sentence just there. Breath remains the vehicle to unite body and mind and to open the gate to wisdom. The breath is just so simple. It's just with us all the time, but we forget, forget about it. And if we can just many times throughout the day, just bring our awareness back to the breath. Just notice one breath cycle. It's a wonderful thing, this incredible gift that we have all the time available to us. 
It's so available that we forget about it. When a feeling or thought arises, your intention, oh, I think I read that bit, should not be to chase it away. The intention isn't to chase it away, hate it, worry about it, or be frightened by it. So what exactly should you be doing concerning such difficult thoughts and feelings? Simply acknowledge their presence. For example, when a feeling of sadness arises, immediately recognize it. A feeling of sadness has just arisen in me. If the feeling of sadness continues, continue to recognize. A feeling of sadness is still arising in me. If there is a thought like, it's late, but the neighbors sure make a lot of noise, recognize that that thought has arisen. If the thought continues to exist, continue to recognize that it continues to exist. If a different feeling or thought arises, recognize it in the same way. The essential thing is to not let any feeling or thought arise without recognizing it in mindfulness. If there are no feelings or thoughts present, then recognize that there are no feelings or thoughts present. Practicing like this is to become mindful of your feelings and thoughts. You will soon arrive at taking hold of your mind. One can join the method of mindfulness of the breath with mindfulness of feelings and thoughts. And as we've often talked about too, we, we often practice mindfulness of sound. And many people are very visual, myself included. So mindfulness of images, just mindfulness of what's in front of me. This is one of my greatest joys in life is just simply noticing what's right in front of me. Practice of just noticing can immediately settle the mind. Calms the whole body and opens us to this gate of wisdom. And I think partly the reason it opens us to wisdom is when we notice things, we are connected. We feel the connection with things. And so we, the habit of, is often to be caught in a fairly small self-referencing world inside our minds. So just hearing sounds and noticing images, like right now here in the Zendo, this beautiful dappled light on the, on the rugs here in the Zendo. And, and then a cloud comes by and then they just disappear. And then the cloud moves and they're there again. <laughs> like just now they're fading away because there's a cloud passing in front of the sun. So we bring ourselves to this kind of awareness. It's so much more expansive than really what turns out to be a fairly kind of constricted world inside our thinking mind. There's another section here I'd like to read. And this is a subtle and very important point. There is a temptation to look upon our thoughts, particularly our difficult thoughts, as an enemy force which is trying to disturb the concentration and understanding of our minds. But in fact, when we are angry, we ourselves are angry. When we are happy, we ourselves are happiness. When we have certain thoughts, we are those thoughts. We are both the guard and the visitor at the same time. We are both the mind and the observer of the mind. Therefore, Chasing away or dwelling on any thought isn't the important thing. The important thing is to be aware of the thought. 
This observation is not an objectification of the mind. It does not establish distinction between subject and object. Mind does not grab onto mind. Mind does not push mind away. Mind can only observe itself. This observation isn't an observation of some object outside and independent of the observer. So this is a beautiful point that the mind is observing the mind. When we're in Zazen and we notice thoughts, the one who is noticing the thoughts and the thoughts are the same. It's all mind. And what is beautiful about that is it can, in contemplating that, is it can help us not um, have negative judgments about ourselves. It can help us be curious and compassionate about ourselves and about these thoughts that we are having in our own mind. They are part of who we are. They're not just a disturbance. They're not just a nuisance. They're part of who we are, and we should be kind towards them. It's okay to judge them in the kind of sense that we might say, I don't think this thought is a useful thing for me. Like, that's okay. But judging as in, this is bad that I'm having this thought, that kind of sort of like has an emotional charge to it, that kind of judging isn't, isn't fruitful for us. The mind experiences itself directly within itself. This is of special importance. And so in the Sutra of Mindfulness, Buddha always uses the phrasing, mindfulness of feeling in feeling, mindfulness of mind in mind. Some have said that the Buddha uses this phrasing in order to put emphasis on such words as feeling and mind. But I don't think they have fully grasped the Buddha's intention. Mindfulness of feeling in feeling is mindfulness of feeling directly while experiencing feeling. And certainly not contemplation of some image of feeling, which one creates to give feeling some objective, separate existence of its own outside of oneself. Descriptive words make it sound like a riddle or paradox or tongue twister. Mindfulness of feeling and feeling is the mind experiencing mindfulness of the mind in the mind. The objectivity of an outside observer to examine something is a method of science, but it is not the method of meditation. Thus the image, he mentioned earlier an image of a guard and a visitor, thus the image of the guard and the visitor fails to illustrate adequately the mindful observation of mind. So here's just this emphasizing that, it, that we are observing ourselves. Mind is observing mind. No need to judge it harshly. No need to try and banish it. Just observing. You can hear the sound of the heater right now. And then maybe a thought goes past, observe, that the, observe the thought. If the thought has some kind of tone to it, observe the tone. So I do think this is the greatest gift that we have to be mindful, to be aware. It's always available to us, always available to us, no matter what the conditions, we can bring our attention to what, to the present moment. 
We can take a breath. We can listen. We can look. We can feel. In fact, yesterday I did a particularly long cross country run. And sometimes when you're doing athletics, you lose your appetite, surprisingly. But I knew I needed to eat before I went to bed, otherwise I'd wake up hungry in the middle of the night, but I wasn't hungry. So it was this really beautiful experience of kind of like just taking half a teaspoon <laughs> like at a time, because I wasn't hungry, I didn't want to eat, but I knew I needed to eat. And it just became this incredibly tactile experience. It was just beautiful, like crushing the walnut and just feeling the texture of a walnut. And then the coolness of the yogurt next to the walnut, because the yogurt wasn't cold, but the, the, walnut, the walnut wasn't cold, but the yogurt was cold. Feeling that difference. Normally I would eat food quite quickly, but last night I ate very slowly. It took maybe 45 minutes to eat just a, a bowl of fruit and yogurt and nuts. And it was lovely. It was really, really lovely. Just to engage so slowly. Thich Nhat Hanh actually recommends, most of us can't really do it, but he does recommend that we set aside a day a week to just be very mindful of the whole day from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. But what we can do is just practice increasing our mindfulness. And maybe sometimes we can eat a meal a little more slowly and enjoy that sensation. But certainly we can very easily, almost any time really, hear sounds, see images. And we do this not just because it's relaxing, which it is, but it creates conditions for wisdom and compassion. I think I'll stop there. See if anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment. Scott. You need to unmute. Thank you, Nelly, for that fine talk. Um, I was just reading something in the Platform Sutra yesterday, and I came across a phrase that struck me, and it was um, when the sixth ancestor, sixth ancestor said, um, thoughts are mind. And I think that has something to do with what you talked about today, but could you, could you address that? Yeah, I think that fits with what I was reading from Thich Nhat Hanh, who was quoting from the Buddha, feeling of feelings in feelings in feelings and mind in mind. That all of all of this is arising in mind. Is this is this limited to the idea of a, the mind only view of consciousness? Yeah. The only, only way we experience anything, experience is mind. The only way we experience things is through the portals of our mind. Yeah. And the effect that, that that has on me is firstly to be very humble that I, I can't fully know anything about anything. I can only know it through the portal of my mind. But it also has the effect of um, increasing a, a feeling of curiosity and um, wonder that we have a mind. <laughs> Can 
people just take their thinking for granted. It's, it's a shame that we take our own minds for granted. It's an incredibly wondrous thing that our eyes can see and our ears can hear. And the teaching is to encourage us to never take it for granted, to be endlessly joyful about it. I mean, I think this is what joy is. This is exactly what joy is. It's wondrousness of our capacity for consciousness and to never take it for granted, to enjoy it all the time. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Daddy. Kai is giving a little applause symbol. Thank you, Kai. <laughs> You're welcome. I, I, I will add something to your description of um, the relationship with food. I know Thich Nhat Hanh wrote somewhere or said something somewhere, maybe it was on retreat, where we should be chewing our each bite of our food like 120 times or something which I can never do but when you do that you are very mindful of every subtle flavor and, and um, delicacy but my recent experience I've never not I've never fasted I never did these long fasts I mean I've gone maybe a day without eating because I wasn't paying attention but I had some kind of stomach thing this week and I hadn't eaten for three days, like nothing. And I had to do a bunch of stuff earlier today. And I suddenly realized that my mind wasn't functioning very well because I had low blood sugar, but I was kind of afraid to put anything in to my stomach because I didn't think it would stay there. But I finally ate about an hour ago and, and I had a similar experience. It's like, the scrambled eggs tasted so wonderful. You know, usually they're kind of just bland. <laughs> scrambled eggs, big deal. But they tasted wonderful and the blueberries were sweeter than usual. So I, I get it. It's like when you really, for whatever reason, pay attention to each moment, it's so delightful. Yeah, and actually you raise an important point too that even though we often cultivate mindfulness in being slow, in just sitting still. We can be mindful while we're going fast as well. So one can eat fast and be mindful. Mm -hmm. It's fine to do that. And in fact, in Sashin, when we do Oriyoki, we do eat quite fast because we've all been sitting for so long and people's legs are tired and out of compassion for other, everybody else's legs being tired, we eat quite quickly so that then people can have a bit of a break. So you can be mindful and fast. And I think people do that often with things like running. Running is a great example where you're moving very fast and you're extremely mindful because you don't want to fall over. You don't want to trip on tree roots and rocks. So you're very mindful, but you're moving very fast. I was thinking about that actually while I was running the other day that I don't get, when I'm running fast, I'm not so mindful of the wider landscape because my eyes are just down on the track. But I'm really mindful of that and it's really nice. It's fine that I'm just staring at the tree roots and the dirt and the rocks and making sure I don't fall. I don't mind that I don't have time to look around very much at the wider landscape. So there's no one way to do, to do this. Mindfulness is mindfulness in a very wide variety of ways. Um, but one way that we particularly do in the Zen school is sitting in Zazen. But that Zazen then translates into all the activities from very slow to very fast, from very small to very big, the whole, the whole lot, the whole gambit which is nice to know that there's no dogma here. 
All right. So we'll finish with the closing chant and three bows.